on Exoplanet Life. My name is Jerry Harp. I'm the new director for SETI research at the SETI Institute, which is an astrobiology institute overall, and our group does the SETI part. Um, Dan Wertheimer, if I just get my notes up here to get this right. He's the co-founder and chief scientist for SETI at Home, and many of you must know of SETI at Home. Uh, it's quite famous, and it's often identified with our institute, but to be perfectly fair, it is really Dan and, and the group at Berkeley who have made this wonderful uh, project happen. And he's working at UC Berkeley Space Science Laboratory. Maggie Turnbull is a world-renowned astrobiologist. Um, she is a renowned authority on planetary habitability. That is, if you had a planet, could something live on that? She wrote a seminal paper with Jill Tarter around 2004 talking about the HabCat catalog. It's a catalog of <coughs> habitable planets. Next we have John Jenkins. He's the analysis lead for the Kepler mission, which means that he may have the funnest job on that mission because he gets to look at the data and his group uh, does most of the analysis that has been done to date and found most of the planets. And leave it at that. Finally, Jill Tarter, uh, my mentor and uh, at the SETI Institute. I, I'm sorry, I, I should just mention that John Jenkins is also at the SETI Institute. Jill Tarter holds the Bernard M. Oliver Chair for SETI at the SETI Institute. And last night we celebrated 35 years of her career at the gala. And if you weren't there, you really missed it. Um, and she's been carrying on city researches on telescopes all over the world for quite a long time. Okay, so uh, with that introduction, maybe I can do it for a second longer. You want it for a second? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, the next thing that we'll be doing is I'll ask the panelists to give you a brief overview of their thoughts on the topic. And uh, after that, the panelists will be talking with each other, uh, perhaps discussing some ideas that they bounce off of each other. And then we'll be opening it up for questions. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Jerry. So I'll, I'll um, start by saying a, a few words about life and primitive life and intelligent life. Um, I'm Dan Wertheimer. I'm from the SETI program at Berkeley. Um, so I'm actually very optimistic about primitive life. Um, and I suspect the universe is teeming with primitive life. And um, as you probably know, life is made of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. And those elements are ubiquitous. They're everywhere you look in the universe. Those elements are common. Um, and so I think we, we probably even find primitive life in our own solar system, right, in our own backyard. And I. Uh, you know, there's uh, interesting moons going around Jupiter and Saturn, and like Europa has uh, a vast ocean of liquid water underneath the ice, and, and we're trying to figure out how to drill our way through the ice and see if there's life lurking down there. And, and uh, primitive life, of course, has been around on Earth for four billion years. It completely dominates uh, life on Earth. It, even inside of a human, um, the primitive life dominates. There, there, uh, dominates. There's more bacteria inside of us than, than human cells. Um, but intelligent life, I suspect, is, is much rarer than primitive life. So uh, maybe one in a million planets where there's primitive life have, have intelligent life as intelligent as we are. Um, nobody really knows, and it's very hard to extrapolate. But, I, um, but I'm still optimistic about intelligent life because there's a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, in our own galaxy, and there's hundreds of billions of other galaxies as well. So even though it's rare, there may be uh, thousands of other civilizations that we, we could talk to. Um, so on Earth, intelligence arose only a, a few times, um, and it took four billion years. Um, and, and I think there are evolutionary niches on Earth where it's good to be intelligent, but most of the in 
most of the creatures have evolved because it's good to be strong or it's good to be fast or it's good to have a hardened shell or make energy from sunlight. But luckily there are a few kind of ev ecological niches on this planet where it's, it's evolutionary advantageous to be smart. And uh, there, that's probably true on other planets, so we don't know how many planets it, it's going to be advantage, advantageous to be smart. Um, the people have argued that because life got started here early on Earth, um, or because intelligence arose after four billion years, you can use these age numbers to predict the, the uh, probability of life or intelligence elsewhere. But when you work out the statistics, um, you can't really tell much about but just because life arose early as soon as the earth cooled down or because it took so much long to involve intelligence, you can't use those numbers to really predict the probability of, of life and especially intelligent life elsewhere. So um, that's why we need to, to search for life because you can't really do the statistics based on the life of just one example of life here on earth. So the searching is really important and I think there'll be interesting searches for primitive life here in our own solar system and if we find uh, life on Europa, um, and if, if it's different chemistry, if it's a different kind of life, if, it has, if it's not exactly a copy of life here on Earth, if it has different amino acids, for instance, then we'll know that there were two independent origins for life uh, here in our own solar system. And then we'll be able to extrapolate and, and, and uh, we'll know that life is really ubiquitous in the solar system. If, we, if life is an exact copy on, on Europa, if it uses exactly the same chemistry, the same DNA and RNA, that means it probably arose only once and was transported between the planets and the, the moons of Jupiter. And, and then we really won't know from, from, from that because it'll be a, a identical life. Um, so I think the only way to look for intelligent life is to do the searching. It's, it, you can't do the statistics. You can't really learn much. You can argue till you're blue in the face. So we have to search. And, I'm very proud of the, uh, the searching that our colleagues at the SETI Institute have done, and there's some excellent searches at Harvard and Berkeley and, and some searches in a few other countries. And the, as you know, the capabilities are growing exponentially. So I'm optimistic in, in the long run that uh, if there are uh, intelligent creatures out there, eventually Earthlings will get in touch. I, that may take a long time, um, and so I wouldn't don't recommend holding your breaths. It, it might happen in our lifetimes. It might happen in a thousand years or a million years. The, as you know, the computing technology is growing exponentially, and, and that's what limits the search right now. And right now, the searches are very primitive, even though I'm very proud of the stuff we're doing using the world's largest telescopes and the largest supercomputers, thanks to the SETI at Home volunteers. We're still just scratching the surface, just, just getting in the game. We're just learning how we might communicate with other civilizations. But, but I'm optimistic in the long run that eventually Earthlings will be able to do thorough searches. Right now, computers are as smart as a guppy, but in 50 years, they'll be as smart as humans. But even so, just looking for electromagnetic waves the way that we're doing this stuff now, looking for laser signals or radio signals, may not be the right thing. And if you look at searches over, um, ideas for searches over the last few hundred years, people used to suggest we, we use mirrors or build large geometric structures or light fires. and so. The, today we kind of laugh at those ideas, but it may be that in a few hundred years we'll be laughing at the SETI searches that, that we're doing now and we'll be using tachyons or subspace or something that, that works much better. But you've got to do what you know how to do. And So um, anyway, I, I'm optimistic in the long run. Well, uh, my name is Maggie Turnbull. I'm, I have a, a small nonprofit of my own in <coughs> northern Wisconsin in the woods, a very habitable environment for me. Um, and it's called the Global Science Institute. And I use it as a way to interact with NASA and um, be able to contract with different astrobiology teams around the country. I started working with Jill um, circa 1999. And, um, and I, I feel like it's it's been always in my blood to do this kind of thing. When the movie Contact came out, I was um, 20, 21 or 22. I was spending the summer in Boston um, at Harvard doing an internship there. And I, I went to go see this movie prepared to be like, oh, whatever, you know, I'd never, I had no, I was aware of SETI. I was 
fair, I'd actually written a pretty passionate undergrad essay about how we needed to be doing SETI and was mad at Congress for um, making it illegal <laughs> to fund such a thing. And um, I, so when I, when this movie came out, I went to go see it and I was like, well, but it's Hollywood. I mean, they, they're not gonna do a good job with the science. I was just riveted and Boston was the best place to see that because everybody was so into it. You know, people were like, when Matthew McConaughey was going to kiss Jodie Foster, people were like, no, don't do it. <laughs> and then told ya. <laughs> so it was, it was wonderful and at the end people were applauding. I personally was, maybe not physically, but mentally standing on my chair, pointing at the screen saying, that's what I'm supposed to do. There is a there's an important role for this kind of work in humanity's quest to understand how it fits into the universe. And we have a problem in astrobiology with definitions. As scientists, we want to try to categorize things as this is alive, this is not alive, that's intelligent, that's not intelligent. We have to start breaking out of that mold. As we begin to, we, I mean, we do, we have to start with what we know, right? We start with, well, this is life as we know it. This is intelligence as it is expressed through us on Earth in this kind of environment. But the, the mind-altering experience, mind-opening experience of beginning to see how, what the diversity might actually be, how intelligence is expressed throughout the universe, is something that is going to require us to break down some of our our definitions and begin to perhaps look at life as something that's more of a continuum. You know, we have, you know, the universe does what it does, it, and it has a whole array of ways in which complexity is expressed, and certainly consciousness is expressed. So, how you how you start out has to necessarily be with, well, this is what we've got, we're gonna look with what, you know, we're gonna start with um, what we have here. We are capable of talking in between the stars in a very stilted manner. I mean, the speed of light is so painfully slow. We just, one of the comments that Jill made last night was that we may not even have invented yet the technology that, that we need to really talk between the stars with other civilizations. and. Maybe there is a whole network out there right now that is talking and we are not tapped in because we don't, we don't know how yet. We don't know how to listen. But this is where we start from. And one of the, the project that I got involved with, with Jill, a whole other story of how that all began. <laughs> but what I ended up doing was trying to create a catalog of habitable stellar systems. We, do, we knew nothing about planets at that time. Jeff Marcy and his group with the radial velocity searches, they were just beginning to um, have this, you know, just windfall of giant planets close to the stars. That didn't seem, those didn't seem like habitable environments, at least for life as we know it. And um, certainly not, you know, the kind of habitable environment that would result in radio telescopes, which is what we're trying to listen for right now. Um, but nevertheless, we, we had a growing sense that there was going to be that was going to be next. We were going to start to find habitable planets, and now, um, at this point, I think we do know. Uh, we probably do know of habitable planets. We're we're not exactly sure which ones they are, but with all the smaller bodies that Kepler is finding closer and closer to the habitable zone, um, it may well be that we already know of a system that is habitable, like ours. Habitability again, as we know it. As far as intelligent life, um, <clears throat> this really is going to be a journey for us in understanding intelligence itself. And I was able to put together a catalog of, I don't know, seven, I always forget the number, it's either 17 or 19,000 stars that could conceivably host a habitable planet. The Hab Zone is not messed up by a big giant planet. It, there's no second star that's swooping through and wiping all the planets away. There's enough heavy metals and materials to make planets out of. Um, the system is old enough, you know, that there would have been time for life to get going and, and radio telescopes to emerge and a number of other criteria like that. But um, 
you know, ultimately there's just only one way to answer this question and you know what it is. <laughs> we just have to search and we have to find it. But we also have to be somehow ready to open to the unexpected and ready to have our minds opened by something that we would not have expected. Um, with regard to planetary systems that we already know of, and is there intelligent life on them? I'm gonna say for the vast majority of everything we know about right now, um, doesn't look familiar. It doesn't look like what, where we live, but it's, it's hard to say no. And again, you have to think about um, how you're gonna define intelligence and whether in fact we're even at the stage ourself of ourselves of being able to recognize it in all its various forms. Good morning, I'm John Jenkins, the analysis lead for Kepler. And my team built the software that processes the data from Kepler that takes us from pixels to planets. So I know much more about how to find planets than about answering the question, is there intelligent life uh, in the universe? And I guess um, that sometimes is an open question, is there intelligent life in the universe? But the fact that you're all here this morning proves there at least there's at least one planet with intelligent life on it asking this question. But to come back to a more basic question, when we ask the question, is there intelligent life out there, we, we think about, are there places for intelligent life to exist? And while it's very exciting to be here at this moment in history when we're starting to discover other worlds that are potentially habitable, we don't know of another example other than Earth of a habitable world with, with life on it. And all the planets that we've discovered to date, the 2,300 plus candidates that Kepler has discovered and the approximately 700 planets that, um, that have been confirmed, we don't know whether those planets are indeed habitable. So f our definition of habitable is, that, is very provincial and that is when we think about Kepler and most people think about looking for habitable worlds, they're talking about worlds that are at a distance from their star for which liquid water would pull on the surface. And we know that all life as we know it relies on water at least at one point in their life cycle. So that's very provincial. That's the, the water hole theory. And I think that's just going to be scratching the surface in terms of habitable worlds. Um, but those are the kind of worlds that we can think about discovering and following up and characterizing. And so I think it's very exciting to be here on the threshold of making this kind of discovery. But even with Kepler, we're still waiting for uh, a, a true Earth-Sun analog to be detected. And what I can say is that the sensitivity of Kepler and the quality of the data uh, gives me confidence that we certainly have the capability of finding an Earth-Sun analog, a twin. Um, but we're going to need a little bit more time to do it. And fortunately, the Kepler mission was just granted a four-year extension, so we can continue the search for another four years. And uh, hopefully, um, in a couple of years, <laughs> that was really not a foregone conclusion. Uh, budgets are really tight, and, and NASA is having to make very, very tough decisions about what to do and what not to do. Um, but I expect that at the next SETICON, we, we will have much more interesting results to talk about, and hopefully we'll have some Earth-Sun analogs to talk about, um, but I guess in some sense, uh, we need to pursue this problem from two angles. One is to uh, look for evidence of artificial radio or optical signals or perhaps other artificial means of communication that we haven't thought of yet. And the other is to pursue the angle of, of characterizing these worlds once we've discovered them to determine whether they really are habitable. Because simply being at the right distance from a star doesn't mean that they have liquid water on them. It doesn't mean that they have life on them. And so we have to look forward to developing uh, instrumentation and launching it, and perhaps using these very large telescopes that are, are being built now, 30 meter telescopes, to, um, to answer this question from the other end, that is from the bottom up. First finding these rocky worlds, 
then determining whether there are biomarkers, signatures of oxygen and methane and other chemistry in their atmospheres, learning about the seasons on these planets, which I think is quite possible by looking at the, the light reflected off them and how that changes over time in their orbit. Um, so I think the next, the next several decades, the next 50 years, 100 years holds a lot of, of interesting science results that, that we're privileged to be on the threshold of viewing. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I also look very much forward to, to the Allen Telescope Array and to the other SETI uh, um, projects that are going on. Because I think at some point in this grand voyage, the two sides are going to come together. And that's going to be a very special moment in humanity. So thank you very much. All right, John. Um, I'm Jill Tarter. Uh, John, I think that moment is going to be Earth 2.0 because when Kepler or some of the other planet finding uh, teams says, look there, a sun earth analog, I think the next question that humanity is going to ask is, well, does anybody live there? And then probably, can we go there? Uh, so it is a very special time. And Dan, you, you indicated that um, that you're very optimistic about intelligent life, but your bet is that microbial life is uh, plentiful intelligence much rarer. Our problem today is that we have, the data that we have are consistent with there being no life of any kind beyond Earth, or intelligent life everywhere as, as uh, plentiful as microbial life. We just don't yet have the data in spite of our attempts for the past 50 plus years to find technological civilizations where we're using technology as our proxy for intelligence. We have such a difficulty in this whole field of understanding what is necessary versus what is contingent. And that contingency, we look at ourselves, we look at life as we know it, and then we tend to think that that must be the way it is elsewhere. But the whole search for exoplanets is marvelous as an example for the fact that we're terrible at extrapolating from what we know to what else is out there. Uh, when before we knew about planets in orbit around other solar type or other um, main sequence stars, we would build models. And you know, somehow the models always turned out so that they were nice and regular. They were all orbiting in a flat plane. The orbits were mostly circular. The big gas giants were on the outside and the little rocky worlds were on the inside. And you know, that's the way it's gonna be when we find exoplanets. And guess what? The first planet we found around a main sequence star was more massive than Jupiter in an orbit that was only a little over four days. And that opened our eyes to the fact that we hadn't gotten the necessary and the contingent right about exoplanets. I suspect we'll be in the same boat when it comes to number two, either in terms of intelligent life, technosignatures, SETI, or in terms of biosignatures. We won't understand biology until we have another example of it to study. We won't understand intelligence until we have another example to study. So I very much admire the work of Richard Dawkins in terms of evolutionary biology. And Richard tends to think that a predator-prey relationship will inevitably lead to intelligence because one ratchets up and then the other has to catch up in order to be able to, et cetera. Um, so aggression in some sense being the base of intelligence and that's why someone like Stephen Hawking claims that, gee, we, maybe we shouldn't shout in the jungle because maybe all the folks out there um, if they come here, we might not like the results. That's one guess based on this 
on the fact that aggression seems to be one of the evolutionary drivers for intelligence. Steven Pinker has a new book that points out that in fact his claim is that today we humans, which is what we tend to think of characterizes the intelligent component of the planet, we humans are kinder than we ever were in the past. It's controversial, but I actually think about the fact that if there's a technology out there that we're going to discover, it is going to be much older than ours. As Dan's already said, you can't detect anyone who doesn't have at least the technological component of 20th century Earth. And because most of the stars in our neighborhood are about a billion years older than the sun, and because our galaxy is 10 billion years old, the only technologies we'll be able to find are those that are long-lived. We'll never line up two technologically short-lived civilizations in the same part of the galaxy, so we have the sensitivity to detect them with our emerging technologies, and in the same part of the 10 billion year temporal history of our galaxy, unless technologies on average live for a long time, so that technology is a good evolutionary uh, trait, helps with sustainability. Well, if you're talking about an old technology, I think to get old, to survive to be an old technology, you have to somehow transcend the aggressiveness that might have been at the base of your becoming intelligent. Again, we don't know what's necessary. We don't know what's contingent. But that is at least a plausible story, that if you're going to be a million-year-old technology or a 10-million-year-old technology on a planet, you've had to maintain your population, either biological or um, uh, some kind of other machine intelligence. You've had to figure out how to manage your resources so you don't need to go boldly go and rape it from somewhere else. Um, and I think that there's an argument to be made that old intelligent civilizations might in fact be folks that we would like to meet. We don't know whether Stephen Hawking is right or whether my guess is right. We won't know until we find number two. And I think, as Maggie has already said, and, and uh, others have said, we won't do that unless we search. And SETI is, is one great way to do that. We, we take what we know, and we try and see what it can tell us about the universe out there. But we also have an enormous program, and we're fortunate to still have, a really robust program of astronomy and astrophysics in this country, looking at the universe with different tools in different ways. And we ought to be encouraging all of our young scientists that when they use those tools and something shows up in the data that they weren't expecting, they shouldn't just clean it up and throw it away and make a pretty picture. They should be like Jocelyn Bell and think about that little bit of scruff. What might it be? Could it in fact be some unexpected evidence of someone else's astro-engineering out there? Because we have a great history in astronomy of building new instruments to answer old questions. That's how we get them funded. But his, over and over and over again, what's happened is that the new instruments have shown us something we didn't expect and have begun to open up new questions, totally new areas we didn't anticipate. So with Kepler, with those beautiful light curves, as we begin to take higher time cadence data of the ingress and the egress from the transit, we ought to be looking at those to see whether the high order moments in those light curves might be telling us that whatever is doing the transit isn't round. And if it isn't round, it isn't a planet. The IAU has told us that. <laughs> so Kepler might be capable of detecting artificial transits, a Venetian blind, a big triangle, something put in orbit to attract the attention of emerging technologies such as ours. So we need to keep our eyes open 
And Maggie already said, we don't know what intelligence is. We're being pragmatic and using technology as a proxy. But let's not get too narrow, filtered, even as we do that. Let's keep our eyes open for what might be out there. Okay, so now is the part of the session when we get to listen to people debate and talk to each other. If you have anything to remark on some of the things that you heard from your colleagues, then I encourage you to do that. Uh, I wanted to amplify some of the things that Jill was talking about first. Um, so um, Jill mentioned serendipitous discoveries. It turns out half of the really exciting astronomy discoveries are made serendipitously by accident. And it wouldn't surprise me if SETI falls into this category that it won't be Jerry or Jill or me or somebody that's looking deliberately for signals from ET uh, or our students. It'll be some physicist doing a dark matter experiment or somebody looking at gamma rays or some finding some glitch in their data. And so I think uh, we ought to be aware of that. I'm not suggesting that Jerry and Jill and I retire, although Jill <laughs> did last night. But, um, uh, but, uh, but we, we, we need to look out and, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's if uh, the discovery of other civilizations is something that we hadn't anticipated at all, it's something completely bizarre like Jill was suggesting. And I, I wanted to echo another comment that Jill made about the age of the civilization. So our sun is five billion years old, and some, but some stars are 10 billion years old. So Ray Norris has worked out that the first civilization we contact is, is gonna be two billion years ahead of us. And Phil Morrison has pointed out that that's like, it's the archaeology of our future. It's, it's learning about what's in our future. Uh, and perhaps we'll get on the galactic internet and learn uh, about all the civilizations that have all been talking to each other for, for billions of years. Um, and uh, I, um, about transmitting signals. A lot, some people think that it's good for Earthlings to transmit. Of course, Earthlings are transmitting all the time television, radio, I Love Lucy's gone past 10,000 stars, the nearby stars have seen The Simpsons, but um, <laughs> this, this question about should we transmit intentional messages out to Earth, we, Earthlings have done that a few times, um, and I, I think that I, I agree with you that, with Jill, that probably civilizations are going to be peaceful, the advanced ones are going to believe in the prime directive if you watch Star Trek, but I, I think it is kind of naive for us as a, a very primitive civilization, emerging civilization that's just beginning to think about life in the universe is that we know what they're going to be like. It's probably true that they're going to be peaceful, but why take these additional risks? And so I don't think we should be transmitting um, signals intentionally out to other civilizations. I think we should be doing passive searches, listening, the kind of stuff that Jerry and Jill and I are doing, are, are listening for signals, uh, not transmitting signals. And maybe after a thousand years, if we don't hear anything, we should think about transmitting, but, but that's a question for all Earthlings. It's not, shouldn't be up to Jill and Jerry and me. So, um, and uh, just echoing on, well, some of the things, uh, Maggie said, um, Congress did ban SETI in 1992, but it was a particular SETI program at NASA, and we've enjoyed SETI funding at Berkeley for the last 30 years or so uh, um, for, from National Science Foundation and NASA. So there is funding from the government to do this, but it's pretty modest, and we get a lot of help from, from uh, individuals like yourselves, and the SETI Institute uh, is very lucky to receive a lot of help from individuals. Um, and Maggie mentioned that the speed of light uh, uh, communication is slow and frustrating. I, 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 I agree. I think, you know, if we find a civilization, it's probably going to be maybe a thousand light years away. So you, you, it's not like, hi, how's your mom? Um, and then, you know, a thousand years, it's, you know, it gets there. And then a thousand years, you get the reply. Um, but I think it's kind of, here's all our music, poetry, literature, science, medicine. Here's our Library of Congress. Please tell us how to get on the galactic internet. And we have advantages of, we have examples of this kind of long time range communication from, uh, you can't talk back to Shakespeare or the guys that wrote the Greek classics, They're, those are examples of communication from a thousand years ago, but it's still quite interesting. So we just have a few minutes left for conversation, so please go ahead. One of the things that, one of the things that occurred to me uh, just now while I was listening to the others is, um, that uh, well, we've heard at this conference about the 100-year uh, starship, and 
Um, it may well be, you know, with the work that we're doing now, looking for habitable planets and Earth analogs, that, uh, that we are actually the first extraterrestrial <laughs> civilization that we will learn about. And that experience itself, you know, finding a destination, discovering um, other worlds that we could conceivably live, live on, the desire that's created as a result of that discovery to go and come up with the technology that can get us there in, in one piece or however many pieces are, are feasible. And um, that, that journey may also feed into this and in our understanding of intelligence and life on other planets and interstellar travel and communication. So we may, we may to some extent end up being kind of self-educated through our own journey of how this unfolds and that may lead then to new doorways where uh, we're able to listen and be aware, you know, in a, in a broader sense of to whatever conversation might be going on out there. I'd like to echo something that Dan said that perhaps the evidence is under our noses and we don't recognize it. I'd like to point out that um, the first transiting planet, HD 209458, was actually observed uh, by Hipparchos and was observed to transit three times in uh, the three year long observations that were made by Hipparchos, but that wasn't recognized until, uh, until the transits were discovered in 2000. And then a colleague of mine, Tim Castellano, who was at Ames at the time, uh, it said, well, gosh, I think it's bright enough, maybe Hipparchos observed it. And we went and looked, and indeed, there were the transits. Um, so it may be quite serendipitous, our, our, our discovery of uh, evidence for intelligent life out there. And of course, the, the playground is getting broader. Kepler has now shown that there are planets around, uh, around binary stars. And uh, three out of every two stars are binaries that you look up into the sky at. Uh, and back in... <laughs> Back in the early 90s when Lawrence Doyle, who's the lead author on that, on that discovery, and I were uh, attempting to seek funding from NASA and NSF to do observations of eclipsing binaries to look for transiting planets, uh, we never got any funding. And one of the responses of the review panel was, well, planets don't form around binaries. They can't. So our imagination, it seems, always uh, fails to keep pace with, with nature. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We, we aren't very imaginative. That's why new that's why new eyes on the universe can teach us so much. Um, Dan, you, you mentioned Phil Morrison's lovely quote that SETI is the archaeology of the future. Uh, actually there's there's a deeper message in there uh, beyond just that we might learn what our future would look like through contacting uh, a, a more advanced technology. It's the fact that we learned that we can have a future, that there really is a future for us. Because, as I've already mentioned, successful detection requires that, on average, technologies are long-lived. So we detect a long-lived technology. Gosh darn it, if they made it, so can we. Even if we don't get the answer to all of our problems, even if you know, we're not talking about extraterrestrial salvation. Just the fact that it is possible to become an old technology, I think will help motivate us to find a way to do that. Well, thank you, panel. And why don't we thank our panel. And now comes the time where we get to answer questions from the audience. And I have a mad helper in the back who's going to be passing around a microphone. And so please use the microphone um, when you get it, that, because this is being taped. Um, but as the moderator of the session, I'm going to take my privilege and ask the first question. And I think this one uh, maybe is for Maggie. Um, this session is supposed to be about the intersection of SETI and exoplanets. That is, what do exoplanets tell us about um, finding life on other planets? And I have a question, which is, if we don't find life on planets, where else could we find it? Um. <laughs> If we don't find life on planets, where else could we find it? 
Um, <clears throat> oh my goodness. Well, we are so oh, we're so limited in the way that we think about life. Everything, you know. I don't. I don't know if there's even here at one of the most you know kind of avant-garde conferences that happens in among in the science community. I don't know if there's anybody talking about uh, life and intelligence that could be sustained without um, certain material needs. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, we think about elements, we think about the sugar phosphate backbone, we think about the genetic coding of some sort, and um, to, we're, we're so entrenched in that way of thinking about life, and that is necessarily tied to materials that we find on planets. You know, we, we don't find um, in enough um, enough density the kind of material that you would need, especially liquid water, really in a, a whole lot of places in the universe. So, um, you know, I could be a little silly about it and say, well, you know, you could find it in, in cracks, in crevices of other bodies that the, uh, you know, IAU does not consider to be planets. How about that? <laughs> but, I, you know, I don't, somebody else have, somebody else chime in and say something more intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> well, Freeman Dyson, who is uh, one of the most lateral thinkers and, and brilliant people I know, has suggested that comets might be uh, incredibly excellent abodes for life, but not the kind of life that we think about. How about the equivalent of a crystallized ice sunflower that turns its petals to capture sunlight? And by the way, would reflect those that same sunlight into our optical telescopes if we actually just looked in the anti-solar direction. Um, there have been science fiction speculations that comets also might have life because the interior of a comet with aluminum 26 decaying might be warm enough to provide water and a place for Fischer-Tropsch reactions to give you primitive forms of life. Um, there are the giant moons of, of uh, this world and, and other worlds where life might exist. And of course, we might find life not at all associated with the stars that were the initial hosts, but traveling between the stars. We might find artificial life in small nanoprobes within our solar system that our observations would to date have totally missed. And the question of whether life can exist on a planet that's been ejected from its star system is now wandering as an orphan along with apparently many others between the stars. That's been suggested, it's kind of hard to understand where the energy source would come from, but as Maggie said, we're limited in our imagination. Um, the same Freeman Dyson that uh, Jill was talking about talked about the, uh, the difficulty of, of life to evolve from water to uh, land, and that that is actually a much more complex process than for life to go from land to space. Um, so um, we may eventually be living in space and adapt to space uh, just as we're adapted to living on land today. And um, Fred Hoyle wrote about life in the black cloud and in interstellar space, so it wouldn't surprise me if life is not just on the surface of, of a planet. Thanks. Uh, so now we'll move on to the audience questions, and I'll ask the panel to keep your comments brief because we have a lot of questions probably. Thank you. Um, Jerry, fantastic panel. Beautiful, all you, that you have said. I am Jose from, uh, I'm a professor at Singularity University at NASA Ames. We have 10 of our students here. And a couple of years ago, we had Jill uh, on a debate with Ray Kurzweil, our founder at Singularity University, and he changed his mind. Ten years ago, he believed there was extraterrestrial intelligence. But when he wrote The Singularity is Near, he said, we are the first. Because if there were a higher intelligence that has gone through the singularity in 2045, in one century, they would wake up the universe. And you had a fantastic debate with Ray Kurzweil. So what are your thoughts on that? 
Are we the first? Will it take 100 years to wake up the universe, Jill? Well, I suggested to Ray that there are things in our universe that we don't now correctly under, completely understand. Um, what is all this dark matter out there? Uh, what is dark energy? Are they, um, is, it a, is it a physical field? Is it, are there particles? Do we not understand gravity? Or is it some manifestation of a super singularity uh, result of another civilization? So I don't know the answer to that question. We can, I suggest, keep looking with the tools we have and the tools we can argue to build. I have a quick comment about that too. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we, we're always talking about this as if there's some kind of linear progress that happens. Like first you start as single cells, then you go multi-cell, then you go through all this stuff and you have dinosaurs and then comets and then blah, 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 and then you get, you know, radio telescopes and then after that you go through the singularity and on the other side of that is this. There's no, there is absolutely no reason to think that this unfolds in anything close to the same manner um, at each time you have um, interstellar communicating um, organisms arise. Once we find an Earth analog, what would you like to see happen over the next 50 years in understanding whether there's life on that analog? Well, I'd like to see us move forward with actually providing the resources to build the instruments that we know how to build or are developing the technology to build so that we can actually uh, take spectra of, of light reflected off the atmosphere and of light emitted thermal emission from the planet so that we can start learning about what the atmosphere is made of and learning about the, the climate and perhaps even the weather of these planets and looking for biosignatures, as I said before. So astronomers, engineers, and scientists are, are terribly creative, imaginative folks, and we have lots of ideas of how to pursue these goals, but there's um, really very little funding to pursue some of these dreams. So I, I would like to see the resources um, materialize so that we can actually go forth and do this work. And of course, we should point our telescopes there to look for signs of um, intelligence. and the. The SETI Institute and our group have been looking at the Kepler uh, planet candidates uh, lately, and we just started setting out that data to the SETI at home participants. Absolutely. Uh, so I'd like to raise another potential perspective on consciousness. Uh, just as in our own bodies and minds, our consciousness emerges from the interactions of the parts, and our brain cells have no notion at all that they're part of this mind that we have. Uh, that we might also conceive that there's a planetary consciousness that we're part of and have no notion of, just as our brain, our individual brain cells have no notion of the thoughts that are going on as a result of their activities. And that planetary consciousness might be the level at which communications occur across civilizations. So I'm curious about any comments about that. I think that's a. I think that's a beautiful idea, and I hope it's true. I guess that um, the, you know, still though, it still leaves us in the position of trying to, to consciously recognize it for Can ourselves. Can you speak to the microphone? Sure. Um, sorry, is that a little better? Yeah. I think it's a beautiful idea, and I hope it's true. But it still leaves us in the position where we, as, you know, we may be part of um, something bigger than ourselves, which, which I don't think you could argue against, but. Um, we still want to understand consciously, individually, as a small part of that system. We want to know it. We want to know that. So that's kind of that's what we're after here. And I think that that's a beautiful picture. And I hope that we can discover if that's the case. But we need to do the experiment. I mean, we're we're struggling with understanding individual human conscious and 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 how to measure it. How to to say it's a reality. What are the tests that we do for this larger theory? I mean, we're talking about dark energy, dark matter, this un unknown stuff, huge in, in extent, yet we are trying to model and build experiments that might tell us something about it. So what experiments can we do to verify this or, or to test this interesting picture? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we know about systems 
is when you have a merchant system that's at a higher, quote, higher level, there's often feedback from that higher system down to the parts. So on a consciousness level, there's possibilities that there would be ways, as you're suggesting, for the individual parts to be aware of the higher uh, system that has emerged. And I think where this takes us into is kind of that tricky psychic region about are there things that go on that we really can't explain through what we understand from, quote, hard science. And I know in my own life that I've had experiences that just seem like way beyond the statistical improbability. I don't have any control over them, but things have happened that I go, whoa, how did that happen? And usually people that I talk with will say, oh, I've had that experience and this is what happened to me and I have no way of explaining this. Yeah, and well, I, there are some wonderful um, psychologists and uh, magicians, actually. Um, the amazing Randy and the amazing conferences who that uh, take a very skeptical look at what you're just describing and, in fact, um, it, probably, it probably isn't beyond the statistical uh, norms, but we remember the outliers. So right. probably I, I, we need to move on to another question. Oh. I think that um, the best way to search for ET right now is to use the physics uh, that we understand today, the electromagnetic communication. Uh, it's not to say that there might be something better than electromagnetic communication. If you and it, uh, as Jill pointed out, there are lots of unknowns in today about dark matter and dark energy, and th there may be something that goes faster than the speed of light, but I think you gotta do what we know how to do. If you told uh, Christopher Columbus, um, you know, instead of sailing to India, just wait 500 years mm -hmm. to find these spices, uh, and you'll have airplanes, it'll make your job a lot easier. But he used the tools and the physics that he understood, at the, and he found something interesting. And so uh, I, I don't think we should wait. Uh, we, should, we should do what we know how to do today. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that at all. And I'm pretty much a hardcore scientist, but it's kind of in the realm of keeping our options open as to what might be true. And it's one of the ways, actually, that this search, as people have been suggesting, can teach us about ourselves. Hi. Um, well, first, actually, in terms of serendipity, I, I agree with what everybody on the panel said, and I'm reminded of the, uh, I think it was Isaac Asimov, the quote that most of the great uh, accomplishments in science are not, are not uh, distinguished by the word eureka, but rather by, well, that's funny. <laughs> um, but the, the question I had was for Maggie, actually, is you had said that you, that maybe you know, life and intelligence are on much more of a continuum rather than just a binary, yes it is, no it isn't. I can see how that works for intelligence. Mm -hmm. I, I'm having trouble seeing how that works in terms of life. Life strikes me as, I mean, maybe I'm provincial. <laughs> life strikes me as it is or it isn't. Uh, I'm wondering if you can sort of expand on that. Well, uh, the reason that I feel that way is because we cannot come up with a definition for life that, is, that, that actually, you know, neatly um, circumscribes everything that we would consider to be alive. And, you know, clearly there is some, there was some kind of progression in the history of life on our planet in the very beginning stages. We don't know when that, how that occurred, that suddenly there was a living thing. And there must have been some in between gray area in between. So um, it's, I, I, I think it's actually not really that useful for us to try to keep things in, in separate categories, but to look a little bit more holistically as, you know, this is what the universe does and, and diversity is expressed in so many, in all these different ways. You know, when we're talking about life and intelligence, we freely admit that we are looking at it from an Earth-centric point of view with today's life and today's intelligence, and just to always be keeping that in mind so that we don't ever um, limit our discovery space to just that. Thank you. Good morning. I have a question about SETI and X exoplanets. Uh, you mentioned Freeman Dyson earlier, and of course he's famous for the idea of the Dyson sphere. And uh, I was wondering if there were any ways that, that we might accidentally or on purpose discover Dyson spheres out there, maybe gravitational lensing or something like that, and does SETI 
point his telescopes to the places in between stars where there might be Dyson spheres that we haven't noticed. Well, our, our, go ahead. Joe. Oh, okay. Early on, uh, it was suggested that we should look for Dyson spheres in terms of stars that had uh, extra infrared emission, right? That this would be a Dyson sphere that didn't completely absorb all of the stellar light so that we in fact could see a star and then we could see the waste energy radiated off the back of the Dyson sphere in the infrared. So you would have an infrared excess. Well, we looked at stars. We found stars with infrared excesses. These are stars that have debris disks. These are stars that have planets in the making. Oh, um, so that particular discriminant hasn't worked, but there might well be uh, signatures that we can detect. I mean, we have used the telescopes to look at places where people were postulating that might be a Dyson sphere. Um, and Dan, you've, you've done us, you've done another specific uh, yeah, Dyson sphere search. Um, so as Jill pointed out, the problem is when, when Dyson predicted this thing, he thought that um, uh, these, uh, these spheres would give off infrared waste radiation and we could detect that in, in the infrared. But um, then we learned that stars had dust around them uh, and that does exactly the same thing as it. Um, and so we did a search, one of my students, Charlie Conroy, did a search for uh, old stars uh, that had infrared because the, it's the young stars that have this dust while the planets are forming and we actually did find a few. We found 13 stars that were older than a few billion years ago, a few billion years old that that uh, we we thought shouldn't have had dust they were, and we there was some excess infrared radiation. We they don't think they're Dyson spheres, they're probably some residual dust. Um, but we did point our optical SETI and radio SETI searches uh, at those stars and published a little paper and other people have done good work since then. So there are still ways that we might be able to detect Dyson spheres. Thank you. Right, and it may be, as Jill said, that we might be able to observe artificial transits and you have to build a Dyson sphere and I don't know how long it takes to build one, but while you're assembling a Dyson sphere, uh, we might be fortuitous enough to, fortunate enough to um, observe one transiting, or at least the pieces transiting, and giving us very strange signatures in the light curve. Okay, we have time for just one quick question. Oh, great. When I first heard of the Drake Equation, I was very excited, and then I read this book, Rare Earth, and that threw water all over the ashes. So, <laughs> in your opinion, was Rare Earth optimistic, pessimistic, or what? I think, uh, um, I, I would answer that, yes, it was all of the above. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, it's true that we are not going to find another identical planet to the Earth. We just aren't. There isn't going to even be another system of planets that's identical. That, the process that leads to the existence of a stable planetary system involves so many unknowns and so many things that can happen, stochastic things like the formation of the moon um, in our case. Um, but we still have to say that we are coming from the perspective of life on Earth, and we have to admit that, yes, um, we're not going to find an exact twin of ourselves out there, but does that, what does that mean? Does that mean that there, that's it? You know, it's either us or nothing. I mean, that seems a little bit limited to me, and we have to be open to the possibility that um, even with all the diversity that is inevitably going to be discovered with planetary systems that still leaves room for life and intelligence similar to what we recognizable and otherwise you know studies you know it's pretty hard to imagine study being successful but there's got to be you know we have to go into this with an open mind we can't demand that everything look exactly like us in order for intelligence to exist out there yeah the rare earth a hypothesis was you had to have a planet that was exactly the right distance from its sun. You had to have a giant moon at least as at the right distance. You had to be at the right distance from the center of the galaxy. All these things had to fall perfectly into place to have life. And we, we now know that, that there are lots of places for life that are way outside the habitable zone 
uh, Europa has heat from, you know, it, it's, you'd think it would be really cold, but it has heat from tidal forces, that there are right conditions, it, it seems, in a lot of different places, it, even in our own solar system. Um, so I don't think you have to have an exact copy of Earth with this exact moon and exact distance. I think that's kind of an anthropocentric argument. And we're, as we learn more and more about life in these uh, um, extreme environments, it, it seems like uh, you really don't, you don't need anything. In fact, some planets, there may be planets that, where evolution takes place much faster that are much more suitable for life. Right. Subsequent to the publication of Rare Earth was a publication by David Darling called Life Everywhere. Um, and, and when I welcomed the REU students to the SETI Institute um, uh, last week, I actually put up these two book covers and said, this is astrobiology. We don't know. That's what we're trying to find out. Right, it turns out. It, it looks like um, the more we look, the more diverse things are. So we have this very uh, simple notion of, of what planets were like. And, and earlier in the 20th century and, and earlier than that, we envisioned that there would be canals on Mars, that there were swamps on Venus, and everything would kind of look like us. So everywhere we look, we see a mirror reflection of ourselves. And as we've learned in the last uh, decade or so, uh, planetary formation is much more diverse than we thought before. We find large planets in orbits interior to those of much smaller planets. We find planets around binary stars, and so it looks like planetary formation is as diverse and robust as is uh, life here on Earth, where we didn't know, certainly when I was in college, that most of the biomass uh, lived under the rocks under our feet, and now we know differently. So life is very tenacious, it's very robust, and, and the formation of places that could be habitable appears to be robust as well. Okay, well, John gets the final word. Thank you, everyone, for attending today, and let's thank our speakers.